The notion of using the wind to do work is as old as time itself. The idea that wind energy could be used to generate electricity dates back to 1888, but it wasn't until the oil crisis of 1979 that the wind turbine in its present form was born. For wind to work, you need wind. The earliest use of wind turbines on a massive scale in the United States was in California, where strong winds from the Pacific Ocean are channeled through several mountain passes. Back then, there were a lot of different ideas of the best way to design a wind turbine. One idea was to put the blades on the downwind side, while others favored the helicopter look of two rather than three blades like we see today. It was, and still is, an evolutionary process. Visit California, and you'll find thousands of early wind turbines barely clinging to life. If you live near an aging wind project, which some people do, this is what you hear. The point of this history lesson is not that old turbines are noisy, but that any turbine will become noisier as it gets older. Unless it's removed and hauled away, that noise won't stop until the machine falls down. So how exactly does a wind turbine work? Let's have a look under the hood. This is a diagram of the average wind turbine. The big box that holds the machinery is called the nacelle. Starting from the left, the first thing we come to is the rotor hub. This is where the machinery and motors necessary to turn the blades are located. The blades are connected to a shaft that runs through the main bearing. The main bearing is very important because it has to support a lot of weight. Each blade can be more than 130 feet long and weigh over 7 tons, and there are three of them. The whole rotor assembly spins in an arc around 275 to 300 feet across, or about an acre and a half, and on a good day, it can have a tip speed in excess of 150 miles per hour. We'll come back to the blades a little later. The next stop on our tour is the gearbox, which converts the RPMs of the rotor to the RPMs necessary for the generator to generate electricity. The important part here is that if there's no wind, there's no electricity. Or to put it another way, wind-powered electricity depends on the weather. Speaking of weather, most places have a prevailing wind direction. That means, for example, the wind usually blows from west to east. But just like one day might be sunny and an hour later it rains, today's west to east wind might change to an east to west wind in a matter of hours. In the same way, a good breeze might taper off to a puff, incapable of turning the blades without warning. Too strong a wind can damage a wind turbine, just as too little wind makes it useless. In order to protect itself, there are two devices mounted on top of the nacelle. One is an anemometer, which tells the turbine's computer brain if the wind is blowing and how fast. The second is a wind vane, which tells the nacelle which way to face. If you pay close attention, you'll discover that wind speed and direction change from minute to minute. Every time there's a change, strong electric motors located where the nacelle meets the tower rotate the 100 ton plus nacelle to face into the oncoming breeze. If a breeze is too light to power those large blades, a wind turbine can spend many hours a day drawing energy from the grid, powering the nacelle to face a non-existent gust of wind. Let's go back to those blades. We're going to play a time-lapse video of a typical wind turbine's summer day in the Allegheny Highlands. The video will make more sense if you know what to look for. You'll remember about the turbine's computer brain turning the nacelle. It also turns the blades to either catch the wind and power the turbine, or to turn them out of the wind and let them freewheel. When the rotor and blades look thin, the turbine is freewheeling and not producing electricity. When the rotor looks thick like this, the turbine blades have been unfurled to catch the breeze and could be generating electricity. This wind turbine is one of many on a ridge line in West Virginia. The turbine and the conditions here are typical for this region. In other words, what you're seeing could, would, and does happen in the surrounding states of Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, and North Carolina as well. From May to October, there are many low wind and windless days in these mountains. 
You're watching the daylight hours of a typical summer day. This is a record of August 6, 2011. Each frame of video was made at 30 second intervals. The flickering blade movement you're seeing, caught by the time-lapse camera, is mostly freewheeling and not generating electricity. Turbine blades freewheel slowly in a calm breeze, even when they've been turned out of the wind. Remember that blades look thin when they're not trying to generate electricity. Blade furling and unfurling is used to protect the machine from excessively high winds and also to save wear and tear on the turbine when there is no demand for wind electricity. Blades are also furled when there's not enough wind to power the turbine. Unfurling the blades turns them into the wind like unfurling sails on a 19th century schooner. This allows the wind to turn the rotor and generate electricity. You'll notice how much thicker they look when they're set to catch the wind. The downside of all this furling and unfurling and the reason for showing you this long sequence is when the wind speed is low, on days like this, a wind turbine spends a lot of time consuming electricity rather than generating it. For wind to work, you need wind. On low wind days, the computer can call for a kind of kickstart. The turbine powers up the rotor to overcome the inertia of the stationary blades for a couple of minutes. This is an additional power draw from the grid that can go on and off every few minutes for hours at a time, and when there are 50 or 100 turbines consuming electricity, it can add up quickly. Less than a year after this time-lapse sequence was shot, before these turbines were a year old, the blades were furled almost every evening after it was discovered that an endangered species of bat was among the carcasses found under the turbine towers. This wind turbine nacelle is able to make two complete revolutions before it has to unwind itself. The output of early wind turbines was measured in kilowatts. Modern turbines like this are measured in megawatts. This is a 1.6 megawatt turbine. That means that when the wind is strong enough to turn the rotor at its maximum speed, it can generate at that level. They call this its rated capacity. In the Allegheny Highlands, those days are few. The wind speed must be over 30 miles per hour before a wind turbine reaches its rated capacity. Let's say that this block represents a 36 mile per hour wind. The speed of the wind is constantly changing. So if the speed dropped from 36 by half to 18 miles per hour, you might expect the turbine's electrical production to be cut in half. Not too bad, right? But wait, there's less. This block represents an 18 mile per hour wind. And if you cut that by half again, you'll get this. A wind turbine might receive 36 mile per hour winds in the morning and a couple of hours later find itself struggling in a 9 mile per hour breeze. A weather dependent wind turbine produces less electricity as the breeze slows. Remember, for wind to work, you need wind. If we think of a 36 mile an hour wind as producing a gallon of electricity, we colored ours blue, half the wind doesn't give us a half a gallon, it gives us a pint of electricity. Cut the wind in half again and the resulting production is equivalent to a quarter cup or 1 64th of a gallon. The next time you're told how many homes a proposed wind facility might power, remember the gallon of blue electricity and the old adage, Things are seldom what they seem. Moving on to other locations, this is an example of Siemens turbines in Oregon, whose perplexed computers have them turning in opposite directions. Did you notice the landscape in the last shot? Those becalmed Oregon turbines are located on flat ground. In this case, the turbines tower over miles and miles of wheat fields, and the grid electricity powering them comes from an actual baseload renewable energy source, hydroelectric power. Here's a different wind facility in New Mexico, also on flat desert ground. Note the large number of turbines not working. Here's a scene from Texas. 
and this pronghorn is making its way under turbans in Colorado. We could go on from state to state, but this map, published by the Department of Energy's National Renewable Energy Laboratory, tells the story. Please note that blue and red areas represent superb and outstanding wind, while areas colored in mustard yellow show regions of our country where the potential for wind energy is marginal. They didn't put white in their key, but it would represent less than marginal or unsuitable. While you're studying this map, visualize the difference in terrain between the high wind areas and the marginal ones. Notice that rather than flat farmland or deserts, the few areas in the Allegheny Highlands where the wind resource is fair or good is at the tops of our rich, productive, forested mountains. Please remember that wind projects, like the one in West Virginia you saw earlier, and lots of others, cannot meet the expectations some folks promise at the time they're being promoted. Wind energy varies greatly from region to region with changes in terrain and weather conditions. Let's recap. Wind turbines can be expected to become more noisy as they age. The box at the top of the turbine tower is called a nacelle and, with its rotor, can weigh over 100 tons. In low wind conditions, each time a wind turbine powers its blades in search of wind or rotates that 100-ton nacelle and rotor, the turbine is using electricity it's not making. The Allegheny Highlands, including Pennsylvania, Western Maryland, West Virginia, Virginia, and North Carolina, comprise a region having historically poor to marginal wind resources. And most of all, remember, for wind to work, you need wind. We hope this answers some of your questions and brings up more. Thanks for watching.